All right, so this slide shows um, a review of circulation, which I've already taught. Uh, we've already mentioned about arteries, capillaries, veins, back to the heart, right? The arteries is the cardiac output, and the veins is the venous return. Now, these should not be new concepts, uh, but what we will do is we'll be more detailed about the physical properties of the blood vessels, the arteries, the capillaries, and the veins. Now this slide has some um, things I had not mentioned before. It shows the heart as the center of the circulatory system, right there. And then it shows the different types of arteries that I haven't mentioned yet. I'll get into it. But it mentions um, elastic, muscular arteries, and as arteries branch, they get smaller and smaller. And then you get to the smallest arteries called the arterioles. That feeds the capillary beds. Um, you can have a bypass where you go straight from artery to vein and you skip a, cap a capillary bed, and that's called an anastomosis. I think I might have mentioned that. Uh, let me write it on the board in case I didn't. Osmosis, you skip a capillary bed. I'll put bypass. Because you cannot have blood flow everywhere all the time. Anastomosis that goes from an artery to another artery, like we saw in the heart, or in this case, it goes from artery to vein. The other thing that's um, new that's shown here is they show lymphatics as a part of circulation. Lymphatics, well, it's colored green, but that's just for illustration. Are a part of the circulatory system. They begin with the lymphatic capillaries, with the blood capillaries. They're picking up the excess fluid of um, capillary exchange. Lymphatic capillaries. Pick up excess fluids and those excess fluids are called lymph. Lymph is fluid. Pick up excess fluids of blood capillary exchange. And as you can see from the diagram, they're going to pick up that blood and circulate it to the um, venous blood. I have a whole, there's a whole chapter on lymphatic, so more details on that later. But at least know that when um, the, this fluid, it, as it's returned to the venous blood, it's forced through lymph nodes, which have lymphocytes, so in essence you're sterilizing it before you put it back in venous blood. So, the, the general idea is, for blood vessels, the arterial system is a distributing system. So that's the idea to keep in your mind. What are the properties that allow it to distribute blood well? Well, you just studied the heart. The heart provides pressure for the arteries to push the blood forward. Then start to think about veins. You have to collect all this blood and return it to the heart. And so we'll talk about how the veins can collect blood well and and how the capillaries, how they function as a good exchange medium. And um, I mentioned lymph and anastomosis. Okay, well, 
All right, so let's first start with just arteries and veins and what are the differences. They're both blood vessels, but one major difference is arteries have high pressure, veins have low pressure. And I, the first thing I want you to know is a, it's a function of volume compliance. So let me show you this picture here. It's a good way to start because in anatomy, arteries and veins, they always run together. Blood is flowing in opposite directions. And a lot of times in naming them, they have the same name, like brachial artery, brachial vein, ulnar artery, ulnar vein. I'll teach the anatomy of the blood vessels, um, maybe at the end of this week. But for now, just the properties of them. You can just look at that cross-sectional view. Um, we already see differences. Okay, just guess, is that the artery or the vein? Most students say artery. Why do you think that? It's the vein. But I'm just curious, over the years I always ask that. Maybe it's because students think, well the arteries, they, they're important, they're carrying the oxygen gene of blood, that's true. So they think the bigger one, yeah, it's gotta have the more important task. Actually, that's the artery. They usually have a smaller caliber Usually the, the vein has the big lumen. Now look at the thickness of the vessel wall, not the overall diameter of the whole vessel. Look at the thickness of that wall and that wall. Which has a thicker wall? The artery does, okay? So those are right off the bat, just looking at that picture, you can see there are differences. Um, one thing I want to point out is that first point. arteries that they receive the cardiac output they're the distributors they they're for collection and return connect In arteries, we observe high pressure. From 20 over 80. Remember, it's always units of millimeters of mercury. If you want to average that as one number, it's about 93. It's not a true mathematical average, but I'll explain more later. Well, in veins, they're, they're very large, but the pressures inside them are very low low pressures. In fact, in even the largest veins, like the vena cava, maybe just a couple few millimeters of mercury is, is observed. So in arteries, you have this dual number, you have this kind of high-low, this pressure rise and the pressure drop off because of the systole and diastole that the heart goes through. But when you, when you go, well, go all the way through the entire distributing system, then get to the capillaries and the veins collect, you're too far away from the heart to have that up and down pulse pressure thing. So just very low pressures there. And what I want you to see is that, um, well, what I had on the previous, what I have on the top there, the concept of this is pressure is a function of the volume slash capacitance of the vessel. So let me, kind of, let me kind of write that as a general theme for both. Pressure is a function of volume capacitance of the vessel. I think most students know what pressure is, right? Like you turn on the water in your garden hose and that water pressure pushes water out of the hose. That's an easy concept to understand. You know what volume is, like liquid, and well, capacitance is how much can it hold, right? The holding capacity. Like how many people can you fit in a football stadium? We, we say it's the capacity. So how much blood can a bus blood vessel hold? Well, okay, so pressure is a function of the volume capacitance thing. And so what we say for an artery is, 
for an artery, they're usually described in books as more or less a stiff vessel with a small holding capacity. They have a small capacitance. A stiff vessel with a small capacitance. So, you know, that's the thing where I asked you, well, maybe you thought the, the artery holds the more blood. No, that's actually the reverse. They hold less blood. In fact, at any given time, maybe of the five liters of blood that's circulating in your body, maybe about 15% of that is in the ar arterial side at any given time. Okay. All right, so let me kind of symbolize an artery by just kind of drawing... Instead of drawing it cross section over here, how about I draw it lengthwise? So they're not very big. They have a small capacitance. They don't carry much blood, so I'll put they have a, they carry a small volume. However, the, the thing to note is this volume, it's small, but it's large for its capacitance because they don't hold very much. They have low, small volume, small capacities. This volume is large for its capacities. So that's the key thing. So even though they don't hold a lot, they, they, they can't hold a lot, but that's large for its capacity. So we observe high pressures. We observe high pressures in our that's that, that, the 120 over 80 thing. Pulse pressure, you know, you feel your pulse, you're, you're feeling. What do you feel when you feel the pulse? You're feeling the difference between the high and the low. Okay, that's why you can feel it. Uh, so any, any questions on that? Does that make sense? They don't hold, it's kind of like, a, I always think of a water balloon. A water balloon is a very small balloon. How much water can a water balloon hold? Not very much. But what do you do when you properly fill a water balloon? You fill it right before it bursts, right? So when you throw it at someone, it bursts. So the water balloon doesn't hold very much water. But if you can measure the pressure inside that water, it's a lot. It's about to burst, right? So that's kind of, I don't know, that's helped me understand it. Okay, well, let's talk about veins then. If it's, it, it's the complete reverse. A vein is a more compliant vessel with a large capacity. It holds a lot. bigger caliber, right? It's, you can look at that picture. It's bigger. There's a big vein. They carry large volumes. Of the five liters of blood in the average adult, about 60% of that at any given time is on the vein side. Large volume. However, this volume is small for its capacitance. It's a lot of blood, it's a large volume, but it's small for its capacitance because they can carry so much. So actually we observe, that's why we observe the low pressures 
in Vegas. We observe. Low pressures in the veins. Arteries and veins usually run together. The ones that don't, like the ones you can see, like, I don't know, in, in your arms and maybe in your legs or in your neck, those are veins that don't have arteries that run with them. You usually want your vein, their arteries to be very deep for protection. Um, you can feel some of them, wherever you can feel a pulse, radial pulse, carotid pulse, femoral pulse. Those are the places where the artery is close enough to the surface where you can palpate it. But usually, uh, you can see veins, but arteries usually don't run with them. So large volume, small pressure, low pressure. Low pressure. So I'll write it in small, like, tiny letters to symbolize that it's low. And, um, Okay, so that, that's the biggest difference, the whole high low pressure thing. So we learned a lot. The veins carry most of the blood. They're like a blood reservoir. The arteries, they have high pressures. They, they don't carry much blood, but that is pushing the blood forward to the capillaries. It's all about getting blood to the capillaries. You get blood to the capillaries, the capillaries do their thing. They exchange the blood, the nutrients, um, the oxygen, the life-giving blood. Okay. All right, so um, that, that's just the first bullet point. Let me kind of go over some of those other things. I'm, I'm going to erase this, though, unless there's any questions. The whole capacitance, volume capacitance thing is really important. So the second bullet point under artery says half sheets of elastic fibers Recoil. All right, so that's so is that. Well, you had the sheet part in your hand, and you could see the, um, for example, the aorta. Think about the arteries that are closest to the heart: aortic arch, brachiocephalic trunk, the subclavian artery. Close. Even femoral artery, way down here, is considered close. Um, those arteries have more elastic, sheets of elastic in them, because they have to handle the systolic pressure of the heart when it ejects the blood and pushes that blood into the artery. It's got to have, it's got to be able to expand, right? And they call that, well, it's just maybe sheets of elastic fibers. Arteries closest to the heart have, have many sheets of elastic fibers. So just like a rubber band, if you stretch a rubber band, but then let go, it'll stretch back. And that's called the elastic recoil. That's very important. It provides, well, I actually mentioned both things. It provides ability to expand the artery during systole. then you have elastic recoil during diastole. And then provides elastic recoil during diastole. Two things there. Systole. What's the number in terms of the pressure that I always write on the board? 120. So then what's the number for diastole? 80, the pressure drop off. You know, it's not zero, right? I mean, if you remember the cardiac cycle, I hope you do, you got a test on it. 
so yeah, you probably remembered it by, by now. Uh, the, the pressure in the ventricle, it drops close to zero. The heart's not providing any pressure during diastole, it's filling with blood. But uh, in the arteries, that elastic recoil, you know, that kind of springing back, it keeps a positive pressure around 80 to keep blood moving forward while the heart is refilling. Okay, so, um, okay. Oh, so veins, because they have low pressures, there's no pressure to keep pushing it forward. The problem you might have is blood starts flowing backwards because it's too far away from the heart. The heart can't provide pressure for veins. Uh, so veins have valves, venous valves. These are like the semilunar valves in the heart. Prevent backwards flow of blood. Now, the arteries, I mean, if they do have a valve, it, it's considered a valve of the heart. It's the first thing you go through to get into the artery, right? The aortic valve and the, semi, and the um, pulmonary valve. Those are the only arteries that would have, it's right at the beginning, but you don't have valves throughout the length of arteries. You do for veins. Okay, that, that, that's the key difference. Um, as you can see from the picture, the veins are more thin-walled. I, I use the adjective squishy, you know. You know, that, that's an easy way for me to tell an artery from a vein when I look at a cadaver. The first color, well, on a cadaver, they're usually more brownish. They're gray-brown, that's not brown, right? But anyways, the arteries are more whitish. So if I say a darker color and a whiter color, I can tell the artery from the vein. And also by looking at it, a thick, a tube that has a thick wall is more like, um, I can just tell. The veins, the wall is so thin, the wall kind of collapses when you kind of touch it. It's hard to explain, you just have to see a cadaver, I'll pull those out. But anyways, the thick and thin wall, I guess what you should know is, um, today's lecture, thin walls. There's a, a, a layer of the heart wall called the tunica adventitia. The veins tend to have a more pronounced tunica adventitia. I'll, I'll explain all the tunics later, but just know that for now. Um, thicker tunica adventitia. Now the arteries, they're thicker walled and it's mostly due to the muscle layer, the tunica media. Thick wall, they have a, the muscle layer, tunica media. Now, they both have tunica media and tunica adventitia. I'm, I'm just telling you one difference is the veins usually have a, a broader tunica adventitia than the arteries do, and vice versa. The tunica media is thicker in arteries than it is in veins. You'll, you'll see that when we look at uh, more histology pictures. I already mentioned the, these things here, that they're very deep. You can have superficial and deep things to control body temperature. Okay, I want to move on. So let's look at a picture of these differences. So I labeled it artery vein. You literally call it large vein. That's the proper term, okay? It's not just vein, it's large vein because there are small veins. And call it a muscular artery. What do you think is the muscle layer when you look at that picture? I'm letting you look, I'm letting you guess in your head. Are you looking at this pinkish thing right there? That is the vascular smooth muscle. And we have it here too. Uh, we, we tend to say it's more pronounced on the muscular arteries. Now, the, the question I have is why do veins have a much higher compliance? Well, look how big it is. And also consider the shape. It's not completely round. It's flattened, and so is the artery, by the way. But um, usually what we say for this shape Say this is the shape of the blood vessel. If you had to fill it more, you can see how it has the capacity to take it. It can like expand and become more round. And what they usually um, 
tell us is the change in shape, you'll have like a double uh, increase in volume and you won't even observe much of a pressure change at all. Okay, so because of that oval shape, they can just pull so much more. And uh, this figure is from your book. And what I did was I just kind of eyeballed it and I kind of like wrote down the mean arterial pressures and the pulse pressures throughout all the different kinds of arteries. This shows you the complete circulation from aorta to the vena cava. So that's going all the way out and back. All right, to generally talk over this figure, look at the pressure on the y-axis and the different kinds of blood vessels on the x-axis. They're listed in order, right, of, popular, uh, of proper circulation. The aorta is first, then your exchange medium. So all of these are different kinds of arteries. These are different kinds of veins. So arteries go from the largest one, do they get larger or smaller? They get smaller and smaller. They increase in number, you, how many aortas do you got? You got one, but it branches many times, in different kinds of arteries, uh, you get to the smallest capillaries. So do you think veins start out small or large? Or smaller, yeah, they start out small, they, they, they merge to get larger and larger. How many of these do you got? Two, superior and inferior. And you go right to the right atrium. So here you're back to the heart, and there's hardly any pressure in there. Um, okay, that's one thing to notice. The other thing is, the whole up-down thing. Now, what the heck is that inside there? You're actually supposed to know that. That's the systolic diastolic thing. I'm gonna cheat and jump forward, then I'll jump back. I know students hate it when instructors do that. You see that green line? That's the arterial pressure of the aorta. That's it. You just imagine just squishing that. And that, that's it, right there, just squished. Okay. Uh, so, you know, they give you the typical systole, diastole, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. You can take an average, um, but because the heart spends more time in diastole than systole, you, you can't just say it's 100, right? So, I'll give you one equation to calculate mean arterial pressure, MAP. It's the diastolic blood pressure plus one third of pulse pressure. So what's pulse pressure? Pulse pressure is, well, it's the difference. So it's systolic minus diastolic. Systolic blood pressure, SBP minus DBP. So in this case, 120 minus 80, uh, 40. 120 millimeters of mercury minus 40 millimeters of mercury equals 40. So then you can calculate the mean arterial pressure. If the diastolic blood pressure is 80. plus a third of pulse pressure, so 40 millimeters mercury divided by three. It's about 93 point something, so I always just kind of round it to the nearest whole number there. Is that that's kind of the classic mean arterial pressure given it's 120 over 80, okay? As it is on this figure. So the other things I want you to know from this slide are that pulse pressures, they get dissipated at the arterioles, okay? Um, no, that's why I put zero. There's no pulse pressure by the time you get to the capillaries. They kind of disappear at their arterioles.
So they're certainly, they don't ever reappear, so there's basically no pulse pressure. And it's not that there's no pressure, there's no pulse pressure. You can't feel the pulse in your vein. Pulse pressures dissipate. Uh, how about just saying disappear? Huh? That's easier to understand. At arterials. Yeah, everything else is pretty clear, I think. Do you see the 93 mean arterial pressure on the figure? They show it to you. Okay, no, I'll play it out. We'll just give you a chance to look. Is that what you're looking at? There's your. So if you ever want to present pressure as one number, not two, you just present it as the mean arterial pressure. So that's that figure. Why does it go red, purple, blue? Symbolizing gas exchange and dropping off of oxygen, picking up the CO2. So that's always illustrated out here. It's very nice. Um, okay, let's talk about veins. The whole thing I said, I mentioned it. I said that veins are a blood reservoir. You should write that in your notes. Here's a pie chart that shows it. Large capacitance vessels are a blood reservoir. They have about 60% of blood at any given time. Systemic arteries, maybe 15%. You can see how it's distributed in other places. But mostly, the blood at any given time just sitting in your veins. So one key thing I mentioned about the arteries, the elastic recoil thing, I, I want to emphasize it again on this slide by asking this question. How do large arteries, uh, how are they able to maintain the diastolic blood pressure when the LV is in diastole? So I show you this figure, because when uh, the heart's in diastole, it's not providing any pressure to push blood forward. It's all the way, pressure's already down here, but the arterial pressure stays really high. It's dropping because blood is flowing away from the heart, but it's clearly not way down here. So again, it's the whole pressure reservoir thing. So let me put that about. Veins, veins have a pressure reservoir. Because people always confuse blood reservoir for the pressure, pressure reservoir. have a pressure reservoir. It's basically the pressure stored when you expand the elastic uh, arteries. Stored in the expansion of elastic arteries. Those are the ones closest to the heart. Don't confuse blood reservoir and pressure reservoir. So that's shown on this slide. During the um, systole, I think it's obvious what's providing the pressure, the left ventricle. So you get a peak pressure of over 100. And the black arrows in shot inside show the expansion of the elastic artery. But then during um, diastole, when you're filling, blood starts to flow, flow backwards, right? And I remember I told you that um, that shuts the semilunar valve for the, the, the duct sound. And you get that quick reversal of blood flow. But what I did mention is the elastic artery is recoiling. And that keeps blood flowing forward while the heart's in diastole. So that, that's the pressure reservoir I'm talking about. Okay, well, let's 
talk about the big arteries and the big veins because in the biggest ones they have the most complex structure they have three layers within their vessel wall called tunics it kind of matches the heart wall layers pericardium myocardium endocardium it kind of matches so think of heart and blood vessels as as being one structure because they have the same types of organization and so i have this three two one two three thing referring to layers of the vessel wall. And this figure is teaching students, well, you know, they kind of like shave it away so you can see the different layers. So let me note it for you. So let's talk about the biggest ones, because the biggest ones, talk about them first, because they have all three layers, or tunics. Think of a tunic as a layer. And the whole job of blood vessels is to hold blood. So these are the layers surrounding the blood that they hold. Well, the innermost layer of arteries and veins is called an endothelium. And this innermost tunic is called the tunica intima. Tunica intima. <coughs> Your book may say tunica interna. Same thing. You can use it. It's fine. I usually abbreviate it TI for short. It's intimate with the blood. It's the internal most layer. It touches the blood. So the layer that touches the blood, I'll just kind of draw it as a round circle here. About, um, it's lined with a simple squamous epithelium. It's an end, call it an endothelium. So each of these little humps I'm drawing, I'm trying to draw flat cells that line this lumen. So the lumen, the space where blood flows, That's where blood is. Um, you know, just put a little redness in there if it's arterial blood. It's, or venous blood is red too. But anyways, that's where the blood flows and that layer around it of TI is called the endothelium. It is basically a simple ET epithelial tissue. And you, you can see it on the picture too. I want to make sure you're looking at what I draw in there. So that I, I drew that. See how I like the, the draw the endothelial cells? It's always this, it was always described to me as a cobblestone street. Cobbled together. It's a pretty continuous layer. You usually don't see any gaps or anything in them. You want it to be pretty liquid tight. It's carrying blood. You don't want to leak in, do you? I mean, I think that's, people know that. You don't want to spring a leak on your big blood vessels. Okay. The only blood vessels you want to leak in exchange are these guys. They're supposed to do that, right? For the oxygen exchange, nutrient exchange, all that stuff. Well, anyways, within the tunica intima, Surrounding endothelium is the subendothelial layer that they illustrate there and there. It's kind of like a basement membrane for the epithelium. How about I go with, uh, I don't know. So think of some connective tissue surrounding the endothelium. Call it a subendothelial layer. is basically connective tissue. CT, connective tissue. So that's still considered within the TI. Now, within large arteries, they don't illustrate one for veins, although sometimes I do see them in there. They drew it like Swiss cheese, exactly like, I've never seen it look like that. So I'll go ahead and give them their artistic license. 
the internal elastic lamina. They call it membrane. I tend to call it internal elastic lamina. Let's go with that. What is purple? A dark color. This is a pretty dark purple. I want to draw it like, you know, kind of squiggly because it's like elastic waistband. Internal elastic lamina, still part of the TI. Internal elastic lamina. Lamina means layer. You can call it the IEL for short. So that is the innermost layer, those three things basically. So you can see why um, you, can, you have a, an elastic membrane kind of in the in the innermost layer there, so it can kind of stretch as it receives the cardiac output. All right, so let's go to the tunica media. That's the muscle layer. Tunica media is many layers of vascular smooth muscle. TM for short. Many layers of vascular smooth muscle cells or SMCs for short. Or sometimes VSMCs because of the vascular. Sometimes people include that, and that, that's fine too. The, the proper shape of a smooth muscle cell, if you recall, the spindle shape thing with a solitary central nuke, they're smooth looking. They don't have striations, but they do have the contractile proteins. They, they just don't appear striated under the microscope. Now, I don't want to draw this a million times. I'll just kind of draw, how about this red line symbolizing many layers of vascular smooth muscle of the TM. Now, leave a little space in there because you see varying amounts of elastic tissue within the TM as well. So you have vascular smooth muscle, but you may also have um, some elastic tissue. How about I just use black for elastic tissue um, for this one? I mean, it's the same tissue as my squiggly line. I just want to use a different color so you can kind of see it against the red. It's all elastic tissue. Anything that I call elastic is going to look the same under the microscope. <laughs> Okay, so you have elastic tissue interspersed between the layers of the vascular smooth muscle. You have, you have much more in elastic arteries, as we'll see. But anyways, that, that's, that's that second layer. Now, one thing I should mention about this layer, because it has the muscle, it can contract and dilate. It receives input from the sympathetic nervous system. So let me note, that's a physiology note there. So these muscle cells receive Sympathetic inputs. So basically, you can vasoconstrict. And if you kind of turn down the tone, you'll dilate. Turn down sympathetic tone. Vasodilate. So those are the key physiology terms. You either constrict or you dilate. A constriction is like squeezing the tube. What do you think that, okay, so you squeeze a tube. Oh, you guys see that wasp buzzing around? Not sure what to do about that. 
when you squeeze a tube, um, you have this long tube, and you squeeze down here. What happens to the pressure bef before, you, before when you squeeze in? You, you increase the pressure. So when you vasoconstrict, you increase the systemic blood pressure. Therefore, if you vasodilate, you would see a drop in blood pressure. Well, that's the basic idea. Okay, so that, that's why I want to point that out on this slide. All right, let's move on. Um, the, the, the tunica adventitia is next. for short. It's this outer jacket. The, this layer actually helps the blood vessel, gives it stability within whatever region it's in. So that way they're not laying around like, like loose computer cables. They're actually well situated within tissues and organs because of this layer. Helps connect it to other things. Alright, so it's mostly connective tissue. Lucy T. So how would I use kind of like how about a different color? How about green? Many layers of Lucy T. Because um, the largest vessels have all three tunics, the T I, the T M, T A, you know the cells that are in the outer layers, uh, they need blood supply too because they're not going to get nourishment from the blood that's flowing in them because they're too far away. So you may see blood vessels in this outermost layer, and it's called the vasovasorum, which means vessels of the vessel. So let me draw little teeny tiny veins. And uh, little arteries to symbolize basal vessel. Arteries of the artery. Or vessels of the vessel, sorry. So that's it, the three tunics. Let's go through um, a discussion of the arteries first. As we'll see, as we get smaller and smaller, we'll eventually get down to two layers, and then one layer, and then build back up. As you get from arteries to capillaries to veins. So the arterial system, you, know, you have figures in your book that can help you study them, like this one. Arterial tree because as our, as the aorta branches, they get smaller and smaller and smaller. And what I like about this is they don't just show you a chunk of a tube of a different kind of artery. They they show you its relative makeup. Okay. For example, endothelium (TI) elastic tissues. You usually see them in. You could see them in TA as well as TM. Smooth muscle TM. Fibrous collagenous tissue, mostly TA. So the, the pie chart or the histogram basically just kind of shows the relative makeup. So 
But for the elastic arteries, those are the biggest ones closest to the heart. These are also called the conducting arteries because they conduct blood to major regions of the body, like head, neck, upper limb, you know, that, that kind of thing. They're the biggest ones. So I'm giving, let me give you an example. How about left common karate? That would distribute blood to the entire head neck region on the left side. Because that's considered conducting. Structurally, it's considered elastic. You can look at the relative tissue makeup. First of all, how many layers have we got? All three. I'll just put a three. And you'll write it there, and you'll forget why you asked me. And I'll remind you, oh yeah, the layers, the tunics. It's got all three. All right, wait, wait. They're called elastic arteries. I mean, look at the elastic in them compared to the other ones. They have the most elastic tissue. So I, I could go on and on, but I already talked about the pressure reservoir, right? Things like that. That's why they're the most important. Uh, well, let's move on to the muscular arteries. And um, these are also called the distributing arteries. Now the distributing artery is a good example of that, say for example, the brachial artery. They distribute blood within a region. The brachial artery would distribute blood within the upper extremity. Now they're called muscular arteries because if you look at um, the smooth muscle, Fortunately, they have the most smooth muscle compared to other ones. Now, what layer was that? T I T M T A? T M. Now, I notice the T M on when I look at these under the scope, it's very pink. When I look at these under the scope, the TM is, is black because of the elastic tissue. So I'm just going to write that as a descriptor. You can agree, to agree or disagree with me when we look at them. For now, just note it. Uh, well, we still got all three layers. And let's start to look and to see the size. Okay, this is telling you the diameter of the entire vessel 1.5 centimeters. You can see that. The arteries may be two, two and a half centimeters. The thickness of the vessel wall, one millimeter. That's pretty thick, the thickness of this wall. And then you get, you branch and get smaller. This is six millimeters. That's pretty good. Okay, and you, you can still see it. You still have all three layers. So we're getting thinner, okay? We're getting thinner and smaller and smaller and smaller. But we can see the elastic arteries and muscular arteries so those are the ones that are named. That would be on your study guide that you have to identify on our models. Um, but categorically, we just call them elastic and muscular arteries. Okay, let's get down to the smallest arteries called arterioles. Now we're down to two layers. So now we're down to 37 microns in diameter. Now to put that in perspective, a hair, the breadth of a hair is like 75 microns. So that's like 
half, half of a hair. I guess you could see that, barely, if you're looking for it. But we're getting microscopic there. Okay. And we're down to two layers. Um, we got TI, TM, but no TA. So if you got no TA, what's your outermost layer? TM. What's the primary cell of the TM? S, M, Cs. And is that what you see illustrated? See those spindle-shaped cells that they draw as a complete layer? Okay. That, that, that's what the TA looks like, but that, that's TM, so that's what you're looking at. So arterioles usually have maybe one to two layers of the SMCs by definition. Um, sometimes they're called your resistance vessels. These vessels have these little precapillary sphincters that if those sphincters clamp down, it really increases the blood pressure. Um, let's see, so let me write that. Pre capillary sphincters. And let me show you a picture on the next slide. So, um, top frame, the precapillary sphincters are open. They're allowing blood to, to few, perfuse the capillary bed. Bottom slide, um, this arterial, the precapillary sphincters are closed. So blood flows through this meta-arterial structure, and you bypass the capillary bed. And so the um, precapillary sphincters are called the resistance vessels. Resistance to what? Blood flowing. When these sphincters are closed, you, you see what happens. Blood bypasses the capillary bed. Can be open slash close. So they're providing the most resistance to blood flow. This thing. Here are some um, histology pictures, and I start with the heart. I don't want to mention some uh, things that might be asked. Identify on the upcoming histology quiz. So let me turn off the dim some of the lights so we can see it a little better. This is the heart. I just might ask you to identify it as cardiac muscle, or I might ask you to why point to it. Identify the dark bars as intercalated discs. And then from the heart, you pump blood to the largest arteries, called the elastic arteries, that's shown here. And I point to where the TI is, I mean, just by definition, it's the innermost layer, so I know it's along the top there. I mean, you can't really see it, I just know it's there. But then you see how big the TM is, and then the TA. You see, you see how uh, black it is? The black is due to the elastic fibers, but what are all the slivers of pink? Smooth muscle. So that's what the collagenous tissue, connective tissue of the TA looks like. That's an elastic artery. Be able to identify it as that or any of the tunics or the tissue makeup. I taught it all to you. Or identify that. That layer is TA, but I'm pointing to basal basilar. I blew it up there. These little vessels of the vessel. Okay. Even that is as well. These layers, the cells, don't have access to blood that's flowing in the lumen, so that's why you need it. So you branch, uh, go ahead. Is there any way to tell the difference between a artery and a vein in the basal? Nah. nah. I can, but I don't expect you to. That's the artery, that's the vein. Veins are usually bigger. Uh, and I see uh, like a thicker wall, that's usually the artery. But that's something I would not ask, but I think you can tell. Okay, there's the muscular artery. Now I see the three layers. TI, TM, TA. I said these are more pinkish, right? That has a higher content of the smooth muscle, but I do see dark lines in there. 
That would be the elastic tissue of the TM for the muscular artery, but it's mostly muscle in that layer. The black squiggly line is our internal elastic lamina, and that's part of the TI. Okay. You can even see the, the dark tissue in the TA, that's probably more elastic tissue there as well. But that, that's definitely from there to there is the TA, the tunica adventitia. We have other slides that show muscular arteries stained differently. This is from the rat testes. And um, you know, all of these I got from our collection. Okay, and I'm just like um, including it in my lecture because at some point I want to show you our slides for the histology quiz. So what cells are these if this is a blood vessel? Red blood cells. They stain black. TI, TM, TA. It's got all three layers. So it's a muscular artery. This is an example of a, where I know you have an arterial. It's called the central arterial. It happens to be from spleen, which has a white pulp. The white is from white blood cells that surround this vessel more or less. So it's a good way to find blood-borne uh, pathogens. So I'll teach spleen later. But anyways, it's got the two layers. I don't point to them, but it's TI, TM, no TA. Here's a close-up of it. I point to it there. TI, TM, no TA. Okay, it's arterial. When you get down to when layer uh, capillaries. Let's do capillaries when we get back from break. I'm back in about 15 minutes. About 9 o'clock.